Hi, this is Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome back to GEOS 1000 Dynamic Earth. And this is to introduce you to the next learning module. After the first one, Science and Skepticism, uh, the Scientific Method, the next learning module, it starts introducing you to the basics of geology. And the textbook starts in Chapter 2 with plate tectonics, and I don't want to start there. The way I've built this course is that I'm starting right after the beginning with first, the, first of all diving into the concept of geologic time, diving into the concept of a 4.6 billion year old earth and how people first figured out that that was the case when they went into it without that expectation at all. And so we're going to talk about that. This covers in the textbook actually chapters 7 and 8. So start chapter 1, do chapter 1, follow that up with chapters 7 and 8. And these chapters in this learning module, those are the readings. You also have two labs that fit within this particular module, labs 2 and 3. Lab 2 I previewed a little bit in the previous episode of this stuff and told you a little bit about what's going to happen in terms of there being a, a road trip through time. And what I'm doing there is adapting a, a fairly classical uh, geological teaching tool. To teach the history of the Earth, you have to analogize it to something because it's too big a number to, to, to think about emotionally. We can think about tens and hundreds of things. Hundreds of years ago, we have actual pictures of maybe family members from a hundred years ago. Um, the Roman Empire, 2,000 years ago. These seem like giant time leaps, but to understand geologic time, you have to go back millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, all the way back to 4.6 billion years ago. And that's hard to wrap your head around if you're not used to the idea. And so we use an analogy of distance equaling time. Uh, one old way people would do this was to be to look at a football field as a total distance and then divide that up into the different time periods to see, get a sense of how big they were. Um, I'm using a similar method in this lab, which I wrote, to give you a road trip across the U.S., starting at the Golden Gate Bridge, going all the way toward the destination toward is uh, the Brooklyn Bridge in New York City. And I use that instead of a football field because we all, I think, if you grew up here, maybe even if you didn't, um, have a sense of the classic American road trip. The idea of taking days to cross the continent from coast to coast. And uh, it's kind of a classic American adventure idea. And so I kind of wrap this lab around that by having you start off in the middle of the Golden Gate Bridge and then start plotting a distance along a route. And this is the uh, I-80, Interstate 80 route across the U.S. from west to east. Uh, you plot this yourself in Google Maps and then follow that route from the middle of the bridge, literally, and plot out distances which represent going back in time. You're going east across the U.S. plunging backward into time. And the Waypoints along that path I'm going to point you to are distances that represent an uh, important moment in the Earth's past, it, a geologic time frame, a moment meaning within that few million years. And the, uh, the device I use in the, uh, the quiz is just to say, okay, if you've gone the right distance, you'll be next to these things, these, this town or this mountain or what have you. And so that's the, that's the precision test. So. It also gives you a sense of the scale of things. Uh, to go back not very long in geologic time, you don't go very far on this route, and then you consider how much further you have to go to get all the way back to the beginning of the planet. And I think that sets in your head a little better. Um, I think it's, it's a thing once you remember, it's hard to unremember. So that's what Lab 2 is mainly about. And be patient with yourself, give yourself uh, time to do it correctly. That's why I have an extra attempt in this lab, actually. Um, so that's lab two. Lab three, which follows that up, is all about radiometric geochronology. It's all about how we know through the natural process of radioactivity and radioactive decay of an element into another element, we can use that, we can leverage that fact to assess the ages of rocks. Let's say you, a rock forms, an igneous rock cools solid uh, 10 million years ago and we can use the isotopes of some elements in minerals within that to determine how long that has existed. 
And so you get an, a measurement. If it was actually 10 million years old, you'd be able to assess it 10 million years, probably plus or minus um, a couple of hundred thousand years uh, with good techniques. So this is what we rely upon today. And if you watch the videos that I include with this uh, learning module about this subject uh, and do the lab, you'll get a better sense of it than you already have, hopefully. Um, I use the device of uh, flipping coins in this lab three. And I use that to sort of represent the idea of atoms that radioactively decay randomly. But over a set period of time, statistically half of them will decay. And so we can use that half-life to determine how long that rock has been here. If it gets too hot to where some of the elements can be driven off, or if, definitely if it melts, you reset the clock. And it, you can't use the technique for that. But if the rock has not gone over a certain temperature, if nothing has really happened to it, if it's chemically intact, we can use its chemical properties to our advantage. So that's what Chapter 3 is about. This learning module includes uh, the readings being Chapter 7 and Chapter 8. Uh, I don't go straight to Chapter 2 after Chapter 1 because I like this order of things. I like that right after you learn about science, skepticism, structure of logical scientific thinking, we're going to dive straight into a difficult concept for a lot of people, which is the immense age of our planet. And so I like you to get a good sense of the age of the planet and the events of its past, which is why I've set it up this way. So chapter seven and chapter eight. Chapter seven focuses mainly upon introducing you to the geologic time scale and to talk a little bit about how the geologic time scale was discovered, how it was put together and assembled piecemeal over time as geologists attained greater levels of knowledge about what was happening geologically, what the, the, the strata layers added up to say to us. So it's a very important thing, and sometimes um, sometimes history of science stuff is presented in a pretty dry way, and it's kind of it can be boring. But I think it's useful to talk about that stuff because, in this case, somebody like William Smith um, in um, England, in I think it was the. Uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, but uh, you can look that up yourself. And he was the first man to develop a geologic map. And today we rely upon geologic maps. And you might say, well, why can't somebody just make a map where you point to where rock is showing and what type of rock it is? Yeah, you could. And old maps did exactly that. But William Smith realized that the rock units were continuous across distances. He could look at by, and he actually worked doing survey work for canal construction. That's how he was, ex he was telling people to excavate or looking where excavations had happened. And so he looked at this layers of rock and realized that from place to place, the same sequence always occurred. Sometimes the layers were thinner or thicker, each one, but the sequence was always there. Or maybe one would be missing, but the rest were there. But they were never out of sequence, ever. And they would have characteristic fossils in them which at the time no one really understood what fossils were, really. Uh, they thought of them as markers, uh, strange phenomena of nature. Uh, it's a psychological perspective we just don't have today. Uh, but they looked at them and said, okay, these particular fossils are found in this particular limestone, and this particular limestone outcrops across this wide area of England, and we can map that unit as a thing. And it's not just label as limestone, it is a specific limestone. And then knowing where the other strata are and where they outcrop, you can reconstruct the history of our planet. Uh, you can find coal and whatever you're look, looking for to mine, which is another reason geology kind of got going. Uh, the initial days of geology were funded by construction projects, uh, railroad, canal, uh, bridge building, all that sort of thing. So the early days of geology were very practical. And William Smith, for example, realized that this was significant and it told us a lot. Later geologists came along and started estimating the age of the Earth based upon what they started to see. And you have to keep in mind the framework of thinking at that time, We're talking about the 1800s or 1700s. The, the assumption on the part of everyone was that the world was essentially a kind of a artificial Minecraft set that was created a few thousand years ago and what they expected to find was a history of sediments of, that was fairly shallow, and then you get down to, I guess, starter bedrock, and that's it. 
And they found a very different world in that. Uh, they found that, based upon what anyone could figure out, looking at how sedimentary materials accumulate in, in rivers or out in at sea, depositing from rivers into the into the ocean or to lakes, uh, you could estimate how long it takes to, to lay down these layers. And when you start digging into the earth, you start realizing how many layers there are, how much time had to have passed to accumulate that complex a history with that much detail and that much stuff. And big swaths of it missing because there was erosion maybe at one time. And then the sea came back and started filling sediment on. Complex relationships that geologists first started figuring out. Basics of the principle of original horizontality principle of succession, where the, the older strata is on the bottom, and the younger one has to deposit on top of that, and then so forth and so on, and so you go up through time as you're going through a stack of sediments, sedimentary rocks. So these realizations basically gave us the starter toolkit for understanding the planet in terms of its real geology, and that's what chapter 7 teaches you all about, and the time scale, how it was put together, uh, the people who did it. I think it's interesting because it put myself in their place, and if I didn't know this already, could I figure it out too, given my clues? And that's an interesting way to think of it, I think. It's maybe helpful. Chapter 8 goes into the history of the planet in terms of the whole shebang, from the formation of the planet in a stellar nursery, along with the sun and the other planets, about 4.6 billion years ago. And then up through time, we talk about the major episodes of Earth's history, um, and how the planet has evolved to today, in, in broad, in broad sweet strokes. But uh, it does sort of lay things out for you uh, in terms of when certain things happened, uh, at what succession of events did we get to what we have now in terms of mountain ranges and coastlines and everything. And of course the rest of this course talks a lot about all that stuff, but it's introduced to you in these chapters. So um, I hope you enjoy them. and. and um, and get a lot out of it. Uh, lab 2 and Lab 3 basically connect with each other conceptually. Um, so I'm going to wind up here and let you proceed and get the work done. Uh, the next one I'm going to be posting is going to be about the next learning module which is about minerals and earth materials and we're starting with identifying minerals in Lab 4. So I'll talk to you then um, and enjoy thinking about the ancient world. <laughs>